Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, uh, instruction course on tackling posterior capsule rupture and ion implantation. It's a video based course, and we have uh, great faculty with us for this course to cover up. We have Dr. Hritika joining us very soon. So, uh, we have a widely covered array of topics uh, that cover up the entire uh, posterior capsule rupture management, starting from complications to all. So, uh, we begin with this instruction course. Uh, uh, Dr. Patha will be coming up next. So, Dr. Ajay Paul, I would request you to uh, take up the first presentation. And we all know Dr. Ajay Paul, he's a dynamic surgeon and a very good uh, uh, human being, I would say. Uh, and he has excellent videos to present and something always enchanting. So, over to you, Dr. Paul. Thank you, Priya, for those kind words and for having me in this course year after year. I think this has been one of the learning experience for me as I graduate myself from still a you know, novice surgeon, I would always call, I learned so many things from you. So I've been talking of the anterior vitre vitrectomy and I will capture. Uh, can I, yes. So I will capture is one which was discussed way, way back in 2003 by Dr. Kimball when he said that capturing the intraocular lens through the capsular axis opening uh, with, which is at least 1.5, 1 to 2 millimeters smaller than the optical is requ uh, required and long-term centration of the eye well prevents uh, the vitreous from coming into the anterior chamber. That's what it helps as a scaffold if you have a PC rupture. And this is another study which has actually said the optic capture affects refractive outcome with a very low myopic shift as compared to had it been in the bag itself. So this is in no way you can always consider it in the bag, especially in the high myopes and all it goes down. So optic capture, you can see this is the various way the lens, uh, the haptic goes into the sulcus and the optic goes into the back and you end up in a spindle shape this way. And there are various other ways of doing posterior capsular axis. You go behind the posterior capsule or both the rexis, haptic and sulcus go. So we'll be talking about anterior capsular axis in this series of cases. And this is, I go with a small around seven minute video. Now look at this anterior vitrectomy and I will capture. Look at these case. This is the first case. As you can see, this is a quite a hard cataract. And as I'm going through with the central trench and then I'm separating the nuclear, I don't know at what point of time I, I even could not make out, but then it's, it's somewhere when I'm doing the left hand, you know, uh, moving those uh, nuclear pieces to the web. That is where I might have ruptured somewhere. The zonules must have given off or the excess, uh, the, the bag must have. That is where I quite saw that there is a big chunk there. And almost all of the lens nucleus is there. So I put in viscoelastic there, high molecular viscose. In this case, viscose. I have no financial interest, but that works the best way to tamper it. Once I get it, this was a five millimeter rexis, so I just rotated it and got it out in the anterior chamber. And I had almost, you know, eaten up a little bit by, by that time. But then again, I went ahead with the, because I put some plug behind the, uh, those nuclear material and reduced the bulk of the nucleus. And it's very important that I put a lot of viscoelastic, which protects my endothelium as I'm doing the rest of the FACO almost in the anterior chamber. Once I've done that, I have reduced the bulk of the nucleus. I find out that place and I put, in this case, a multi-piece eye well. It goes first right over the iris because the pupil was small and I didn't know whether it will go directly in the bag in this stage. So I put it in the... Uh, over the iris, and that is the classical way everybody can do it. And then carry on with phaco malsignation again under the cover of high molecular viscoelastic. This is very important. And once you're there, then you actually take a stock of the situation. You might have some uh, nuclear or cortical matter stuck there. You can go ahead to the vitrector. This is what I'm doing, going ahead with the vitrector, a small nuclear pieces with that. I can eat it off. And then Gradually, this is the, I, mean, I got a, enough space to put a viscoelastic and this, I take it on the sulcus, rotate it and other haptic again, I rotate it. So this is very important on what plane I work at. I should work it at a, at a, at a just below the iris. And this is where very important how you push it. And once that is done, I do my tapping of the nucleus. I am the optic of the lens. And once I've done that, I check it, whether it's the uh, optic has gone behind the, uh, the 
excess margin and a small paper it becomes difficult and one has to be very careful whether if you want to do it so it goes right behind and then i finish it up with my the routine tram single on test i see there is no much of a vitreous and whatever is there i can remove it and once it goes there and the the tram single also helps in you know reducing the inflammation and this is another case where i'm going into the last pieces and when i'm going to the last pieces i am left with a little bit of epinucleus and all that's the time when i see that there is a um, opening there and there i'm trying to take it and the infusion is on and there i you know, go there it will the epinucleus and there i see a big opening there big pc rupture once i have that and now i know that uh, i have to remove the remnant part and there i go with my in this case as the pupil is dilated i go with my scaffold right into the sulcus instead of i you know waiting for putting in the iris See, there i have uh, noticed it i've got the space there i've got that potential space that the leading haptic goes into the sulcus the training haptic again i just keep it over the iris and there it is i just keep it over the iris rotate it and take it there over the iris once that is done well there and see a lot of uh, particle matter that comes out I go with my vitrector, clean up that. That once I have done with that, there uh, use a alternate vitrector and IA. That means I mean almost all machine you can do. And uh, here I can use the cut IA with uh, lower you no know, cut rates so because you are removing the cortex and then follow it up with once I've cleared the vitreous and I follow it by uh, IA mod and there I have got and then once I get it there uh, yes I'm removing the part of the uh, the cortex there and then I just tap it and get it over the uh, below the uh, the rexis margin and then the customary uh, check with the tram simulonic and then I can see uh, yes, a lot of vitreous is still there and then I continue with my vitrector vitrectomy whatever is going uh, on so this is how you know it helps that anterior the lens with the optic capture has helped it to keep it within the the vitreous back and the vitreous design in the post-op period if there is a sudden exertion and all the vitreous will not come out in the anterior chamber so it's very important you get a right size of rexis in the case if you have a rexis around six millimeter then that would be a problem the lens would still pop out so and it becomes difficult with the multi-piece lens and this is again on my case i'll just show how we are doing the uh, Captured there, you can see I'm carrying on with that by manual IA, and at that place somewhere down the line, either I left the infusion off, there I can see the rupture there, and this is how I go in with it. You can see the I've got a potential space made, put in viscoelastic, and the lens goes in slowly there. I just got it. It's good that you can you know support it by the left hand at this stage, but however. The lens is again rotated, taken into the sulcus, and there it's uh, that there you can just tap it one to the left side and right side. So you get that spindle shaped, you know, anterior excess margin there, securely placed. And in this case, I was sure there is no vitreous because I had just tamponated the vitreous with the high monocular viscoelastic. And again, there will be case I think part will be showing next. Uh, that Andre, uh, can you just stop for a second? There yeah. is one band coming of the time. We are not able to see your video. I don't know if it's for me only or for all of you. One broad band right across the IOL with the timer showing. The room for... Uh, no, I can request you to change the view uh, of Zoom. So on the screen itself, on the right hand side, top bottom, you will see view over there. And yeah. then you can make it as a speaker or maybe as a gallery. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 I just continue it. Sorry. So this is the case where there is a. You can see a horizontal tear there. Now look at it. The margin of the tear. The tear is not exactly in the center. A bit off center. So the my question was whether I can put the lens in the bag or not in the bag. Now I put a lens in the sulcus. The reason I'll just show you. There's a similar case. You can see there. Uh, there is a upward margin of this. And see the similar case when there is a rupture, I put in the lens and see the, the visco goes right behind it. So I, I'm sure there is no vitreous here at this stage. So in this case, see, I put a high molecular viscoelastic, so plug that hole. And again, I put it, I go to the periphery, the cornices, again, rightly. 
And here I put a single piece IO. Now this single piece IO, this happened to be a toric IO. So I could even put the toric IO slowly and this particular lens is so soft in the bag, the way it opens up. And this was done almost seven or eight years back and I'm still follow this patient yearly. And see, in this case, see, since the margin was rolled uh, up rolled, and there was no, I mean, I could have put a single piece also, but then that would have been a risk. And so in this case, again, as I said, I put a uh, plug of the uh, high molecular viscous elastic. And then the same way I take out the, um, the space there behind the iris. And then the lens goes slowly. So it's very important that you go, you see that trailing, uh, the bleeding, are you getting in the right place? And once that goes in there, see slowly again, and roll it, see that the, and see at that point, again, go in there, right. It's very important, this step is very important, you can say there, but lock it, lock the other side, and once this is locked, this will stay forever, that way. I think I showed you some picture in the beginning, how the, the spindle shape, and that is the break there, and you can just, in this case, thank you, thank you for your, patient here. Thank you. Can I go in next, uh, Priya? Priya, yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, myself? Yeah, Priya, no, no, Priya, you Priya. have to unmute. Priya. Priya, unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. yeah, actually, uh, my that Zoom screen went off, so uh, that's why. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ajay Paul, for this wonderful presentation of yours, and it was really great to uh, have this. Uh, optic capture seems to work uh, very well. So, could you just summarize this in just just two steps that are very important for a newcomer to learn when you are doing an optic capture? See, first of all, you should be sure there is no vitreous. You have removed it. And the last two little bit I showed, I want Dr. Parthu would be saying, where you do optic capture, because almost all of us are, I mean, youngsters will become expert surgeon. If you have that break through and through or up and down, if you see the rolled margins are rolled up or see, you know, vitreous is there. If you can clean the vitreous, definitely you can put the lens in the bag. But if you're not sure that the there is a vitreous there, if you're trying to put that multi-piece lens or a single piece lens there, you would push it and make the break still bigger and then the second point is you have to see that the leading haptic goes to that potential space between the iris and the rexis margin and the, uh, the, uh, the training okay. haptic goes yes. and the rexis should be 5.5 5. 5. it should not be more than that. that's very yes important. that's uh, you should have an optimal size of rexis to do an optic capture absolutely yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Ajay Paul, for this. And I would like to invite now Dr. Partha Viswas, uh, the man behind this entire show, and he's the most busiest person around. Thank you for uh, uh, being here, Dr. Partha. And uh, we would like to uh, hear some great tips from you and your uh, uh, presentation on uh, posterior capsule uh, rupture to posterior rectus and then doing an IOL implantation. Thank you very much, Priya. Uh, what you said was not right at all. It's been a whole teamwork of all our scientific committee members, the backend team, and everybody else, you know, who has done this job. Believe me, it's really tough organizing a, a virtual conference. Very a virtual nice. conference is very, very tough, I tell you. But anyway, the entire team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good I have some dynamic people around me, Dr. Chitra, Dr. Partha, everybody like, you know, so I, I feel really good about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> they exude confidence. They exude you know, so much of positivity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. So uh, PCR, when it has occurred, the best thing to do or the most important to, uh, thing to do is a PCC. And if a PCC is achieved, then the intraocular lens implantation can be very, very smooth. However, if in a case where a PCC is just about impossible, when it is impossible, then how do you do? So let's look through this video. And uh, this is a big nucleus that is there. And uh, you can see that uh, if I have to remove this nucleus, there's a lot of maneuver that is to be done. So I first and uh, I put in the viscoelastic, high molecular weight viscoelastic in the bag. And then that separates out. And uh, at least if I'm trying to do phaco emulsification, and this is phaco emulsification under as low parameters as possible, 
trying to take it up and I'm constantly looking at one particular tissue and that particular tissue, I'll just pause in between, that particular tissue is the iris. The moment you're looking at the iris, you will notice that if the iris tremulousness is too much, that means the viscoelastic has leaked out. So you need to fill in viscoelastic at that point of time and then go ahead with the phaco emulsification. So that's a very small, but a very important trick. The next thing is, if you have been able to compartmentalize the uh, different tissue at the different levels, then this dry aspiration or with the fluid aspiration of the remaining cortical matter can be done. But remember the fact that if it has to be done, it must be done gently. And the moment you feel that you have actually disturbed the vitreous or the vitreous has come in, then what you need to do is to do a vitrectomy before you go on to any amount of aspiration. Because what one is not supposed to do is aspiration of the vitreous. If you aspire the vitreous and look in this case, the vitreous has come and you can see the ovalization. I'll definitely have to do a vitrectomy for this. And Triamcelonone assisted vitrectomy is what every one of us should do for two reasons. One is that you do understand that the whole amount of vitreous has been taken off by the vitrector. Next thing is it actually improves the tissue healing and the cornea the next day is in a much better scenario than you would have without the use of triamcelone. That amount of triamcelone for just about a minute or a half a minute works wonders for the corneal endothelium. So let's keep this in mind as well. When PP, PCC is possible, what is that situation? Now here we have a, a central rupture. We have a central rupture and uh, this occurred when we were going ahead with it and <clears throat> as we go ahead with it this rupture that we have to do is now if it is a small central rupture then you really can do a very good pcc and uh, you don't need to be worried about the integrity pcc is not difficult therefore if uh, if you have detected that is a small rupture best is to take time off it may take you two minutes to five minutes but get a pcc done and you can see that this pcc was done well and now you any amount of manipulation in the bag is possible and you can go ahead and place not only a single piece lens but also a multi-piece lens inside the bag so once the multi-piece lens is placed inside the bag, again, you need to take out all the uh, elements of the uh, viscoelastic and, of course, watch for any, uh, any amount of vitreous in the anterior chamber. Here, of course, in this case, vitreous would not possibly arise into the anterior chamber, but one needs to be sure again. So let's look into this um, situation where you can see that it has been a difficult situation and I've had difficulty uh, in doing this surgery we have these five hooks already and uh, we have uh, what you can see it is uh, the rexis is a small one and uh, the rexis has been done therefore you understand that it was a small pupil I did a small rexis I had trouble taking out the nucleus and then thereby <clears throat> we have this situation so but even in this situation with this small rexis anterior rexis you can still do off a posterior capsule rexis and once that is done uh, it is a, uh, you have a better stable bag now here i'd like to just tell you that the vitrectomy that can be done has to be very very particular and uh, you need to take up the vitreous here of course if you are doing a anterior vitrectomy you should have a good amount of uh, infusion that is coming in and uh, the vitrectomy should be actually cutting the vitreous and do not put too much of methyl cellulose or viscoelastic because the wastage of the cutter cutting the methyl cellulose itself is not desirable what you need to cut is the vitreous and here of course you can go in from the pass planner and do a pass planner vitrectomy that is also desirable so uh, here we have completed it we put in the three piece lens in the bag in the sulcus sorry and <clears throat> we capture it let us go to the next situation. And uh, <clears throat> in this situation, it is a PCR with a nucleus. And uh, 
with the cortex there so this is a ppc a classical ppc that we have and uh, here uh, we have uh, the um, uh, the nuclear fragment is also there so i'm scared if i do any more manipulation we will lose the rexis possibility of a pcc so i go ahead and first do of the pcc so the importance here shown by this video is do of the pcc first if it is possible if it is not possible you can go ahead for the manipulation and the removal of the next part of the cortex and the nuclear matter so here the important take home is if it is a small rupture put in viscoelastic have the layers of the viscoelastic nicely there and then place uh, then take off the rest of the remaining parts of cortex and nucleus here as you see the nucleus is still there and i am putting in the lens because i do not want to disturb the vitreous um, as much as possible and thereby i know that the, i can definitely uh, remove this amount of uh, nucleus that is remaining and uh, that's not a priority as of now priority is getting the iol in place in the bag here we have placed it and getting the nucleus off, out after that and of course if there's any amount of vitrectomy to be done that needs to be done so let us not think of uh, which one to come first the priority is always if it is possible the pcc must be done and let me again assure you the pcc is not a difficult procedure it can be done quite well so here we are and ajay has already alluded to in his previous presentation a pcc is impossible and this is a case of a posterior capsular rupture where uh, the pcc is not possible at all and uh, you can see the horizontal uh, um, the rupture that has already occurred and here in this rupture ajay told very very important things see after seeing this video one must realize that it is not to be done for every situation it is not so in this situation again i'll repeat what i just said a posterior capsule which has ruptured is curling up which means that there is a vitreous upthrust then you have to be very careful because that bag has not opened the anterior capsular axis and the portion between the tone posterior axis is not open so the posterior capsule and the anterior capsule should be in different planes for your in in the bag implantation of the intraocular lens so this is a very important thing and here we could see the space and you have to visualize that the space is there and the next technique is you have to implant the lens not directly into the bag because you might harm the vitreous but it has to be on the plane of the iris so that's trick number 2 so if you have implanted on the on the iris the next procedure is making a knuckle of this haptic optic so we made a knuckle and under direct visualization we placed it inside the portion of the bag anterior capsule and the tone posterior capsule similarly again i'm going to stop and show that this is the way this is the technique that you have to do that knuckling effect has to be there here i must again warn you if you are not at times you know because the pupil is coming down and you're not able to visualize the tone parts and the anterior capsule then these are difficult situations you might don't be groping in the dark at all because no more harm than uh, good can be done at the end so here again we are able to visualize so we place it uh, with that knuckle the knuckle first should go in if the knuckle has gone in the haptic will follow so the, these are small small important things but of course you have you have to have your savior and the savior is the three piece intraocular lens which again can be placed if you are not able to do the right procedure and place it in the right plane just take it out it has to be taken out and there would be handling of the vitreous and all that those things i understand but don't leave anything to chance in these cases because if you have not been able to put the leading haptic in the bag it might actually dangle down and you might have a more problematic situation than what you encountered so last video that i would uh, share with you is uh, this was a little more uh, 
a difficult situation because uh, you know the same situation again a ptc which go from end to end and uh, but still can we place it in the bag so here we tried to place it in the bag and uh, here uh, the situation was that you know the amount of cortex that there was was much more than in the previous situation but all the time as you can see i'm doing a dry aspiration on all the time now what is the deviation from the previous video the previous video had uh the <coughs> transverse type of tear in this video it is a longitudinal tear can you see that it's a longitudinal tear so and one part of the tear is eccentric so we have a smaller capsular bag in one place a larger one in the other place and it is longitudinal so let's see how we can go ahead so we put a blob of high molecular weight viscoelastic in between just to have it safe and sound and then we place uh, as we said the leading haptic onto the iris and then turn it around and here you know that knuckling effect is very difficult uh, and i'm trying to place it in the bag and it has to be under as i said very good visualization because if this is not then we might lose the bag so i could visualize that it has gone in the bag and you can see that the anterior capsular excess is up there and now i can do this knuckling on this side which is simpler definitely and but again let's have a very nice and widely dilated pupil for all these little tricks that we need to do any case i would always tell let us be as safe as possible if it, if you think it's not you're not uh, confident to do a procedure like this please do not do not, not required to attempt it you will achieve as good from any other procedure or placing the uh, three piece intraocular lens on the sulcus and capturing it thank you very much uh, for your patient hearing thank you patra i think you brought out those very important points number one that visualization when you are trying to attempt as you said that for all cases where this you put a multi piece lens in the sulcus it i will capture if possible not possible but an excellent visualization is very important if you are attempting to put the lens now about the posterior capsular excess now you know uh, this is especially for pediatric surgeries and all this has gone out of fashion in the sense they use the vitrector now is it possible in an adult because in a child because it's elastic it is very nice you can get a round excess but is it possible in an adult to do a uh, with the vitrector a posterior capsular excess around so i'll tell uh, this is a very important question to answer ajay because uh, in the in the adult the rupture has already occurred so the greatest difficulty that you are going to face is the rupture extending so the rupture should not extend so here if you have a small rupture and you're going ahead with a vitrector there is a possibility that the rupture can extend whereas in the pediatric cataract what we do is we first place the lens in the back now nicely it has gone in haptics and everything nicely done then we go in with an mvr and then put a you know a okay. split the posterior capsule and then go ahead with the vitrector and again that thing is easy because your haptics and everything is all in place so here it is uh, really difficult i don't think that would be a very correct solution and also let us uh, remember the physics of the ruptured capsule the physics of the ruptured capsule would tell us that it is not a perfect circle thereby it can extend anywhere it it can so the rupture extending will put us into a greater difficulty so the first thing would be the maneuver to do of the rexis if that would be possible yeah again as you said i mean the visualization is so important there yeah. that you can have to because many a times you try to pick up you will be picking up with a stand and very rarely would be there would be a rupture without with just surrounded that area yes. so it's very yes. important they do the rexis and then do Anyway, those right. maneuvers were very, very beautifully shown. Thank you, thank you. I think Priya will be joining us a little bit later. I, we have Dr. Chitra. Yes, sir. G good evening. Sir, thank you very much for joining because Priya always has you in this course, and it is very important that you give your inputs and the vitreous knowledge. Yes, really sorry because I had the stuck to Partho uh, in some other session, so I request in case I can present at this moment if yes, you allow. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I'll just uh, share. Uh, Chitra was going in next. Chitra, is it yeah. all right? Lalit sir. Uh, I think in. Chitra does it, and then Lalit sir does it because your poor will be summing up all the. Oh, oh no. Okay. Uh, so. Lalit. 
screen is visible na he is not listening uh, hello yes, sir. yes sir it's visible okay uh, so thanks uh, dr partho and priya and ajoy uh, fun to be part of uh, this uh, webinar on a very important topic which is very close and we keep uh, but webinar nahi hai sir mat boliye please sir but chai ho si hai aur aapka yahi ho si hai sorry sorry uh, thank you thank you so uh, uh, we will because the topic is so relevant and uh, uh, priya does this course uh, so well that it automatically finds its place in uh, all these conferences and all the speakers are so good and so uh, you know you said in their talks that the message conveyed are very nice so i'll just talk about uh, how posterior segment surgeon views this pcr so i always begin that every surgeon can have complications even uh, ajoy paul or uh, or uh, chitra or ram murthy everybody because people who operate they only can have obviously it occurs more during learning phase suppose i start doing phaco i will i will obviously have 80% chance of having pcr but uh, chitra will have one in say a million or so but apart from learning phase of a budding surgeon it is the over confidence of a established surgeon you see if somebody is in a hurry so never operate in a hurry or at the fag end of the case you know you want to go somewhere so that is the when you may create this disaster so for me actually honestly every surgeon can have complication but issue is not a complication but surgeon is known by how he manages that complication so that is more important and this is where i just illustrate with the help of videos what i want to say that this is one situation i hope this video runs so there is a pcr which has happened in this so you see what surgeon is doing here so he has started doing this uh, automatic vitectomy so era of swapstick vitectomy and vanas vitectomy has gone and should never never be done it's in history now it should sent be sent into archives so the other thing is he is doing automatic vitectomy but his concern is that what is he cutting is he cutting the vitreous or he is presuming that he is cutting the vitreous so that is the issue so the issue there is that it's a blind kind of vitectomy and what is being done is not seen and then you put an iul so believe me this is a compromised eye very high chance of developing cme and also don't uh, underestimate that it may develop into detachment also so doing a blind vitectomy by anybody by retina surgeon or by cataract surgeon is not acceptable at all so what should be done so better would be what is being done here you see you see this video pcr has happened but this surgeon is clever he has put tricot crystals now you see same instruments being gone put here so after we remove this excess of air bubbles here you will see the vitreous strands very clearly you see it is the removal of this vitreous strands which is very important because they exert traction they are constant source of uh, inflammation and this thing which will cause cme or maybe pull on the peripheral retina or 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 detachment or such things so what is advocated is that and these seven surgeons who are not very familiar with the trocar system or cannula system and are afraid to enter the parsimony area should do at least tricot assisted vitectomy and not the blind vitectomy which i had shown prior to that so best is that if you have a vr surgeon friend with you call him i think he will do a better job not because ki he is a better surgeon but he is more familiar with the vitre surgery than the nta segment a lot of nta segment surgeons today are are, a, are, are do a vitectomy very well but if you are not very confident please don't hesitate to call in the best interest of the patient because i think ultimately patient will be the gainer so end point would be that there should be no vitreous strand in the ac or in the wound nice round pupil and always try to use a good cutter good cutter is a cutter which cuts more and sucks less whereas because the possibility of this pcr happening is so remote so normally people use whatever cutter is available and whatever available cutter may be risky because it will cut less and suck more so that is the issue so always have a good cutter in hand and uh, do a vitectomy as i had shown and i am repeating here always do a tricot assisted vitectomy and never never do any other uh, blind kind of vitectomy 
so in the event of this crisis also you see sometimes you see nucleus management or or cortical fragment or even or even this uh, uh, you know a fragment may be an issue so in such issues where pcrs happen never use this big big instruments wire rectus inside the eye it's all going to spoil uh, your visual results and tarnish your image also but this unsatisfied patient is going to go from places to places and somebody will tell him that this has happened and just because you didn't manage properly so this will uh, tarnish your image so if you want your patient to stick with you you have to give good visual results and if you want your patient to respect you he has to have good 69 vision 66 vision unaided and if you don't want to face situation like these which i have shown in the bottom photographs actually photographs taken from vitreous loss patients giant tear pvrs and task kind of syndrome so always respect the vitreous and the best way as i said is as do a tricorticoid vitreous and the reason i told the clear vitreous is very difficult to see you can do the vitreous but you are doing a half hearted job transcelidon has the property it gets adsorbed onto the vitreous fibrils so that vitreous is now easier visible and thus facilitates precise job complete job and reduces the chance of complication best would be to do this what i am saying here now because i wish that all all anti segment surgeons learn the art of uh, uh, you know trocar canal system it's not very difficult you do such uh, you know big big jobs why can't uh, you know so anti segment surgeon learn this so what is being shown here is that there is a pcr which has happened again a blind vitreous me and pulling you see whether it is cortical fiber or what believe me vitreous is entangled here in a patient of pcr and the more you do this the more risky it is for the patient so best is you see what i keep telling learn this trocar canal system insertion and this animation which i borrowed from youtube uh, let's see wasawada exemplifies what i am trying to say you see red color is the vitreous and if you do from behind this will go back and nothing will happen to this pcr what is there but if you do from anterior segment so if you keep pulling the vitreous like this you are trying to enlarge the pcr and you see how ragged this has become an enlargement has happened so best is to like this with the video exemplifies here the surgeon has done the rectus there is a runaway of the rectus but the surgeon is very confident that he will take out all this soft ventricular uh, matter but he could not succeed and hence the vr surgeon was called he makes all the vitreous ports and does this job very very easily respecting the vitreous cutting the vitreous not pulling the vitreous and also taking out this ventricular fragments along with the the probe only and at the end of it you see the, the, the this is cleaned up very nicely and then the iul can of the put there and this gives the best result you see and at the end of it well centered iul round pupil no vitreous stand in the ac and i would prefer actually to put a tricot here just to we can from this so take home message will be that pcr management from the limbus root carries the risk of extension of the rent traction on the retina and possible residual vitreous also but if uh, people learn to manage from the pars plana then all these things may not uh, happen and ultimately the possibility of cme the traction on the retina and a chronic irritable eye need for nsa drop drops frequently that will be much much less so we one should get away from this thought block it's a mental block that you can't enter pars plana learn this beautiful trocar canal system and you will do a great service for these patients so last slide always do transcranial assistive vitreotomy if you are not confident of entering pars plana area that will prevent you from seeing all this complication which are there on the right side thank you very much for your time and patient listening thank you lalit sir i think you drove home the point very important i think all anterior segment surgeons have become used to triumph single on now whether you see vitreous or don't see vitreous at least for the sake of post operative inflammation going down we do put it even if you know sure that it is there uh, 
So one, joy, I don't know. I that is that is a, that is a byproduct of using triangular norm. Yeah, yeah, that's it. But, then, that, but no, I, I just wanted to. I don't want the message should go that purpose of triangular norm is to decrease inflammation. Yeah, no. But, but PCR is it also gives it inflammation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say because I see a lot of I mean, me being a VR trained and then being a FACO surgeon, I mean, just become and the concept came in, we started doing it easily. But there, you have an edge, you have an edge actually. No, no, the fear was fear is always how do I put a trocar in a soft eye? Now it's very important that I have to do a second infusion. So, but a, just a AC maintainer does the job. That's yeah, very, that, is, that is acceptable. That, that, that if you just but put if an AC, to or if you just to put an if you take a fresh stroker, fresh stroker, yeah, yeah fresh stroker, because our our habit is to keep using stroker system till the time uh, uh, you know uh, sister throws it away. We yeah, normally use it. We pass from the VROT to the anterior segment OT. Take this old stroker. <laughs> no, no. If you put it on instead of that, if you, even if you put the uh, bimanual irrigation from the side port and then put the troker, it becomes very easy. And then I would, I would, I would, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, thank you. I think we'll have okay. Chitra thank speaking, and then thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Ritika. Priya would be joining. Hi. Chitra, you have to unmute. Yeah. Very good afternoon to one and all of you, and thanks a lot, Dr. Priya. She hasn't joined back yet for uh, including me in your course uh, every year, and Really, it's as if I have won a prize each time I see myself in a course. So, thanks a lot. So, go on, going on. What's happening? Yeah. yeah it's there. So, uh, uh, this is a very routine kind of a case, which I thought I'll start off. But see, the, you can see that it's a large uh, uh, pupil, large uh, and well dilated and hydro is done, a good rotation is done. And then I've just got a superficial purchase of the new very soft nucleus, and then I go and just trench it, and then I got two pieces. So there is one clear pace in the PC, clear clarity, but still the nucleus is rotating freely, so I feel pretty sure, no. But then there is vitreous there, and I've started off, I should have stopped earlier, I should immediately plug it with viscoat. Now this very small quantity of nuclear frag, uh, epinucleus, soft uh, epinucleus, so I go ahead, then I go ahead and do a vitrectomy, ensuring I don't hydrate the vitreous, and the ease with which now I'm able to remove the cortex is an indicator that the vit vitrectomy is quite complete. And with great confidence, I enlarge the incision. And absolutely foolishly, I go in with my three-piece IOL, thinking I have support on the two sides and I've placed my IOL in the back. When I think with enough confidence, I go in to remove the viscoelastic in front and behind the IOL, wherein I easily see that the haptic is now slipping into that area of rent. And then it becomes jugglery to get the optic and the haptic up into the sulcus and then position it. So in the primary situation, as was very beautifully elucidated by Ajay and Partha, that you can do this only if you have converted a PCR into a PCC. Could you contemplate injecting an IOL in the back and the, especially a three piece and even if it's a three piece sometimes the way forcefully it tends to get injected you have to be very very cautious about the whole process that even with a PCC I wouldn't advise a three piece I would probably advise a single piece to be tucked in the way Partha told us elaborately how it has to be done. Now this is a typical case of a polar cataract and there are, we have to always start the surgery thinking that the PC is actually open. So the first thing is you need to create a small rexus, not too large, but not too small, of course, thinking that this might become the scaffold of placing the IOL and the, in the later date. Then the routine mechanical separation of the thing is attempted because there's going to be no hydro in this case. Visco dissection, maybe I would do after the nucleus bulk is removed and only the epinucleus is there. Most importantly, the whole manual should be so gentle, keep injecting visco so that the capsule bag never sort of gets compressed. The hydrostatic pressure does not increase. So it has to be a completely slow motion FACO emulsification and no extra manipulation in the eye. At this point of time, you could inject visco, uh, do a visco dissection and have the entire epinucleus coming in. But sometimes you may be cautious, you may not do it, but it would get, sometimes you actually prolonging the step, you actually impact, create more stress on the zonules. 
then go into the site code, inject risk code because you already see a PCR, but the vitreous disturbance has not occurred. So gently tease from both sides, go in from this site code or that site code. At any point of time, you feel that the AC is challenging, go back and inject some more viscoelastic push the vitreous back so that it does not come forward. It's quite uh, safe and good because there, there was no vitreous disturbance there and you've had your last piece out. So there's no need to do a vitrectomy in these kind of situation. Balloon up the space in front of the rexis and the iris. And once you have done that comfortably, very slowly inject, ensure that the haptic is in the sulcus space, rotate it and position it, and then remove the viscoelastic and then just tap on the optic of the IOL and do an optic capture. And then you have realized as, as if it was a single piece in the bag and you would uh, get the same kind of a visual outcome in these kinds of, in these kind of eyes where it has been a well done surgery. Now, this is a case where the surgery is, the core nucleus is out, but you've created that small flap in the posterior capsule. One, I could have gone and done a PCC or keep the phaco probe in inside the eye, go in through the side port and inject viscoelastic so that again, you are pushing the uh, vitreous back so that it does it is kept tamponaded. And then maybe here in this particular case, I'm injecting a single piece IO exactly the way it has to be done into the AC gently, nudge the haptic into the capture is going to act as a scaffold. So as there was not much of an obvious vitreous disturbance, here the haptic has been placed in the sulcus. But if you want, you could leave the haptic on the iris itself. And then once the IOL is placed, now with this protection, which is well covered the pupillary area, you could do phaco emulsification and remove the remaining nuclear fragment. By now it's obvious there's enough vitreous disturbance. So you go behind the IOL, do a thorough vitrectomy, and in the process, some of the loose cortex and all comes forward. You check whether there's any vitreous in front. As you can see, a strand was there. Inject triquart at this point of time. Ensure there is no aberrant vitreous strands anywhere. And then you have done the surgery. Now, this is a case where the patient came from elsewhere with a decentered single piece IOL and an obvious uh, PCR, which is there. So first and foremost, before you start any manipulation, you should do a gentle vitrectomy. There was not too much of vitreous presenting, just a blob of vitreous was seen and do a good vitrectomy because now you're going to do something different. You're going to manipulate the IOL, which is actually sitting in the vitreous partially and partially in the capsular bag. And after having done a thorough vitrectomy, you're sure that you have got the uh, single piece IOL up on in front of the rexus. And now you would inject a uh, viscoelastic and enlarge the opening. You need not cut all the way through and through. You could do it whichever way you want. Sometimes you could just go halfway up and then that hold that point and that acts as a fulcrum. And then you remove the entire optic of the uh, optic and the haptic of the IOL. And then you inject viscoelastic again, balloon up the space in front of the rexus and then place your lens. Do a little vitrectomy if you feel you have disturbed the vitreous. And then if the rexus is round, do an optic capture. This is the last video which I'm going to show a similar case. It's a decentered IOL. So first and foremost, you place your iris hooks because it's not very clear. Is it just a dialyzed bag because of which the IOL is decentered? Actually, if I were sure it's a multifocal IOL, if I were sure that there's a subluxation, then I would have placed a CTR, but it appeared as if there was probably a PCR there, which was missed out and the IOL has been placed. So I get the entire IOL outside. And as I had alluded to, keep my side foot away and then with the other vitrectomy, do the cutting, inject tricord, see there's a lot of strands in the anterior chamber and in the posterior chamber, and then inject a three piece Multifocal IOL was injected. We do keep a battery of these lenses in these kind of situations, but you need to uh, under correct by 0.5 and then position the IOL in the in the sulcus and then do an optic capture and of course for place a suture at the main wound and thus you have bailed yourself. Oh, this is the last video which I have here. There is the patient came back the next day with an epinucleus fragment behind the IOL. At this, this point of time, it's mandatory to place a pass planar entry and place a trocar because you're not very clear how the how good the PC is because it was an 
on a pc which is a pc rent which has occurred and the doctor surgeon has not known and placed the iul so you would not want the pcr to enlarge so you would like to do a vitrectomy from the past plena where there is less vitreous which is going to come forward and you are cutting vitreous at its home so there is going to be less traction on the vitreous base and once you have ensured that the epinucleus is out and the visual axis is clear and the vitreous vitrectomy is thoroughly done you could even inject tricord at this point of time to further check whether you have done a complete job of uh, doing a vitrectomy which is what was done and then you complete the case so essentially manipulating an iul with an uh, evidence of pcr one is convert the pcr to a pcc if you could help it try to place a single piece iul in the bag only even if you feel there's enough on the posterior capsule gently nudge the haptic into the bag otherwise place a three piece rex uh, iul in the sulcus and do an optic capture and rarely if you could place a three piece iul in the sulcus if there's not enough space you feel the pcr is large and the rexis allows it then you could even do a reverse optic capture and get the optic out of the bag and just the haptic in the bag and thus bail yourself in all these challenging moments thank you thank you dr chitra this was a wonderful presentation uh, glad to have you here i would just like to know that uh, how was the outcome uh, uh, of the implantation of the multifocal intraocular lens that you had placed in the bag in the I mean, sorry in the sulcus yeah because the optic capture they do very well there is a, i mean that's not the primary way of having done it but definitely i would we do keep a three piece lens especially if it is a polar cataract and inadvertently you have to tell them they may have a rent but you still try to bail them out in these moments they are all happy only okay the, the outcome was good the patient was happy no complaints about uh, that so that's uh, a, a pretty good and uh, to sum up i just uh, liked your videos and i would just also like to know for the benefit of the audience uh, that uh, when you are handling uh, uh, the uh, lenticular matter or when you are doing a vitrectomy uh, uh, which one do you prefer like initially would you like to go ahead to the anterior vitrectomy and then go to the pars plana or you directly like to do first up pars plana no i would do an anterior vitrectomy only i that particular case mandated a pars plana approach but i would prefer to do an anterior vitrectomy or supposing it's a very small area of zonular dialysis and there is a blob of vitreous there i wouldn't want to go in anteriorly and increase that area of uh, uh, zonular dialysis because there is fluid also going in in those kind of moments going to the pars plana route you are actually just doing a focal vitrectomy there and the area of dialysis remains the same so those particular points yes i would like to do a pars plana vitrectomy i mean it is not that what i'm saying is just the right approach ideally doing pars plana in all these cases would be the right approach but then you need to have a good understanding of the anatomy of the eye because in small eyes the pars plana may not be located where it ideally should be being an anterior segment surgeon you shouldn't go wrong in placing so you have, should have learned that art before you do it absolutely Uh, any questions for Dr. Chitra, Dr. Ajay Paul, Dr. Ritika? You want to ask something? So, I think uh, Dr. Chitra, everybody is so uh, floored by your uh, not floored. Uh, I think must be uh, either hungry for their lunch or in the post lunch. Uh, yes, the state. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra, for this uh, wonderful presentation. So we now move ahead and uh, we invite uh, Dr. Ritika Sachdev. She is a young dynamic surgeon, always uh, at the edge of the technology. She has an access to everything. Uh, she is going to uh, showcase us the femto cataract and the PCRs associated with that and its management. Over to you, Dr. Ritika. Thank you, Dr. Priya, uh, for the kind opportunity to be part of this IC. Uh, I will be talking about femto cataract associated PCRs. Fortunately, the technology has evolved to a level that the number of PCRs you have with femto cataract are uh, limited. But uh, let me start with an older video. Uh, you see, the OCT is rather grainy, and this is an older video. We are using the lens X. Now we moved on to the catalyst. So there is a dense PSC kind of a thing, but you're not very clear. You see that there's a grainy uh, patch that you see here. The capsular axis has come in, and uh, this is the matrix pattern of segmentation of the nucleus. And 
what we do here is a little bit of a hydro now do know that this bag is already under pressure because of the gas uh, which has been generated by the femto so a little bit of hydro and not deep up deburping this bag can lead to a pc rupture this happens in initial cases and has been reported uh, with the initial lot of uh, learning curve of femto but i think as you learn to burp the ba burp the bag and to be more careful you don't have this complication anymore so you see here it's absolutely the red glow is so shiny that you know that you've lost the pc uh, we will be doing an iron scaffold technique here as beautifully shown by dr chitra the only difference here of course is that the femto has already segmented this nucleus so because of that it tends to cheese wire it is not easy to deal with this nucleus in a single piece though like when you are doing an sics or a levitation you would want a single piece so that you are able to just uh, take it out in toto but here it is broken into smaller pieces we still maneuver it into the anterior chamber it has been softened which will be useful while phacoemulsifying it this is a three piece lens one uh, and you see one end is above the iris and the second is also above the iris we've not put in the sulcus yet and after the phacoemulsification is done above the iol and with visco dispersive between the nucleus piece and the cornea this iol can then be positioned as a three piece iol in the sulcus and you can choose to optic capture it the beauty of a femto is that the rexus is beautifully sized so a 5 mm re rexus would lend itself beautifully to an optic capture it's a central uh, uh, rexus uh, now moving on to more cases which you've done with the femto these are essentially posterior polar cases where you will face a posterior capsular rent in a large amount of cases you see here on the slit lamp there is a vertical slit in the posterior capsule but let's see the use of a femto cataract as a diagnostic tool now when you do an anterior segment ocd with a femto cataract you have an in vivo assessment of what the posterior capsular status is going to be like and you see here there is a purple line that you can trace all along we did a study that we found that when this purple line can be continuously traced all along none of these cases the posterior capsule gave way wherein if a purple line is broken like you see here there is a patch is a large shadow there there is an increased propensity for this capsule to give way 70% of these capsules gave way the 23 or 27% that didn't give way were because there's a shadowing effect when there's a dense very focal uh, uh, plaque kind of uh, opacity but this is very heartening to know that if it is continuous you know you are safe in a femto when you have a, a posterior capsular dehiscence you must increase the posterior offset because you want a thick epinucleus and you don't want cavitation bubbles to pressurize the posterior chamber so this is the femto procedure uh, happening the posterior offset has been increased we haven't done much softening it's a segmentation that has been done this now is a pneumo delineated now you see here this is the oct the intra op oct coming into play just look at the, though there is a gaping pc right from the beginning a thick epinucleus and a stable ac with stable parameters and a slow motion phaco without the un, uh, without the maneuvers of rotating it or hydro dissecting it will keep it stable so you have the posterior capsular rip coming right in the end and this is a very very important step wherein don't pull out before pulling pushing in viscoelastic this is what you will see on the oct that the vitreous phase which would have herniated out this is the intra op oct you see that the vitreous phase is intact if you let the ac collapse at this point you will have the vitreous gush out with herniation because the ac will become depressurized but because we fill it with viscoelastic this is the only knob which is an intact vitreous phase that stays and as you um, can so basically we use technology to get things right this is a lack of judgment do you have a central rip it's not a pcc a single piece iol cannot sit in this bag so though you may have the best of technology never ever forget your basics a single piece has been put in the bag you know not a single piece in a bag like this without a pcc not a good idea and there we have it it's decentered it's vertical it's vertical 
and we need to take it out. This is using technology, but forgetting the basics. So uh, anyway, paradise can always be regained. We latch on to the haptic and we you do know that you even if you dial this in the sulcus, it is an incorrect thing to do because the thick haptics will cause more uveitis, glaucoma uh, and inflammation and uh, risk of CME, endothelial damage. So what we've done here is we've removed the uh, single piece lens. No compromises anymore. You have to put a three piece lens with the haptics in the sulcus. And since you can't visualize the capsular excess, don't be afraid to use books even if uh, you need, uh, even for the short time where the IO has to be perfectly positioned because visualization really is key. So this really uh, patient did very well. And uh, this is another case where we have uh, a large uh, posterior capsular deficiency, which we know from the anterior segment OCT. Actually, when you've seen on the anterior segment OCT, you know you have to block this patient. And sometimes even if you want to put a parse planar trocar system, if when you feel that this will be a large game, you can do that. So this is, uh, again, the same maneuvers because it is pneumodelineated and it is segmented. Just centrally placing the FACO, you simply just chop in the pieces, no hydro dissection required. And this is the right way to do it. Don't experiment with a single piece IOL when you have a vertical drip like this. A three piece IOL is a stable choice in all these patients. And these patients do very well. This is the paper that we published saying that the anterior segment OCT has a great remarkable role in helping to give a high negative predictive value and predicting that yes, this PC is not going to give and a 71% positive predictive value, letting you know that this PC is more likely to give. You see that the uh, uh, AS OCT and other Schempler guided devices can also give you a view of the procedure capsule. And using these two image and predict the status of the posterior capsule allows you to tackle it better. Thank you for your attention. Uh, wonderful presentation, Dr. Ritika. Uh, this was a clear cut uh, demonstration of how you can use the technology to your advantage and how uh, it, uh, it guides you throughout the procedure. It guides you even before you start the procedure and also it drop it. Okay. So I think and some of the points that you had come forward with, they were uh, brilliant. If you have the technology of using a femto and uh, assessing the anterior segment OCT for these cases, uh, it's phenomenal. And if we do not have that facility, then we should all stick to basics, you know, like uh, what Dr. Hitika said, do not withdraw your probe accidentally if you have a split. And uh, uh, all these points uh, which uh, she has uh, um, uh, shown us and which she has uh, highlighted us uh, in such a subtle manner, but uh, they are all very, very important uh, thing when it comes to handling a posterior capsule rupture and, uh, and uh, its complications. So, uh, Dr. Ritika, I just wanted to ask you that I, I think many people across the world are now using the IOL skateboard technique. And as you showed in your video, you know, uh, there was a, uh, in a femto, it had already emulsified and all that. So do you follow any special trick in such cases to bring the entire nucleus in front? Or is it that you just slip the IOL so that it automatically forms a shield that uh, you can do that? Because if it gets trapped beneath that, then it becomes a problem. Yes, so we do. Uh, uh, basically, we've even used posterior levitation at times when you know that there is a large rip and posterior capsule, you can actually put in blunt instruments to the parse planar root also and that really helps levitate them upwards also and by manual blunt maneuvers they are able to come up and uh, this pattern was an earlier case wherein, wherein the problem with the earlier lens X was that the matrix pattern used to cause more cheese wiring with the catalyst now you have segments and the cheese wiring doesn't happen because the, in between the segments it is the softening that has happened so this is a particular cheese wiring that is uh, particular to the matrix pattern and it's not as difficult with a routine segmentation. And for cases where there is a large posterior capsular uh, rip likely, we normally go for segments or cylinders. It just makes it easier to take them out. It's only if the cataract is very hard that you need to go in for segmentation, uh, for softening. Dr. Chitra, you want to add anything to this? And Dr. Ajay also, you have been using femtos. So you want to add something to this? No, as she says that... Uh... But then most of the time you still have the peripheral areas which are attached. I mean, the only thing is the peripheral area is soft. Once you have done softening and all, and PPCs of late, we have been using a bigger area, bigger soft, bigger cubes. 
so that you know unlike the concentric circles that is there in lens x the catalyst doesn't have those concentric circles so you can use those big big bia and once it ruptures as she has says in ppc cases well uh, end of the day if there is a vertical or horizontal if you are not sure that you can put it in the uh, in the uh, bag it's always a good idea to put the lens in the sulcus and i will capture because you hardly have any refractive changes as it is shown in various papers so i think that's what very well it said perfect so i think that was a great uh, round of discussion here so i think i go ahead with my i'm the rapid try you want to add something or we go on i should i go on with my presentation i think we should take this opportunity to introduce dr priya <laughs> i think dr chitra uh, ma'am can just unmute and said myself and uh, dr priya narang is one awesome surgeon from ahmedabad and uh, who has been a chairman uh, scientific committee for her uh, gujarat state of the mix society and is a person whom we would all want to have as a moderator or a part of the surgical group and uh, i'm sure we are going to have lot of learning from priya thank you dr chitra thank you so much so i uh, just to add i think we all admire your innovations right from the four pass the uh, fourth row pupilloplasty yeah. to the virtual perimeter i think you have a knack for these things and your brain is always working on something new mm -hmm. so we always look forward to something exciting thank you thank you, thank you. you. just taken the glue dial to a next level yeah. that, that's what i did what was initiated by dr amar i mean you have taken it. thank you so much it's popular you. made it reach to every surgeon thank you so i think i begin my uh, presentation here and uh, i hope this is uh, visible to all yeah. yes i'm it yes so uh, well um, i start my presentation for uh, my instruction course of tackling posterior capsule rupture and iron implantation so i'll be just showing the challenging and the uh, cases this is a decenter 3b intraocular lens uh, there, there there are a lot of things that you see in this case you know uh, the first is that you have a 3b intraocular lens so i take this opportunity to refixate the same intraocular lens uh, second thing that you see in this video is that you know there is a somering ring and the after cataract uh, which is present in this case so this uh, case actually i think initially the optic capture was done but somehow the vitreous tend to push this uh, uh, lens aside and what you see, you can even uh, if you concentrate you can even see the small amount of eccentric posterior capsular opening that is present so the optic capture has been done for this had been done for this case it has decentered the patient has come up after two years with lot of uh, after cataract uh, material out there So decided to refix it this uh, same intraocular lens. So the uh, before you go in and venture into these cases, it's it's, it's essential to clear uh, uh, all the after cataract and the the, the somering ring and the fibrotic material that is uh, encapsulating the uh, uh, intraocular lens. And once it has been done, then we follow the simple procedure of uh, glue dial because two flaps have already been made. Uh, 180 degrees opposite. You hold the tip of the haptic and you externalize the uh, one of the haptics. uh you do a handshake technique and with handshake technique it's a transfer of technique from one hand to another uh, till you reach the tip of the haptic so once the tip of the haptic is visualized we enter from the uh, other sclerotomy side uh and then you grasp only the tip of the haptic and you externalize these haptics during this entire procedure uh, fluid infusion is a must i saw many videos in other courses where i saw that uh, uh they were doing uh, intracellular fixation but there was no fluid infusion going on in the eye actually that should not be done because it leads to collapse of the eye you cannot keep on uh, uh putting viscoelastic inside the eye in these cases because these cases have an open anterior posterior communication which is there and viscoelastic at no point of time uh, uh, is uh, uh, going to keep your globe taut so fluid infusion is a must because uh, fluid is a uh, uh, is it's a, it's a natural milieu of the eye and uh, fluid infusion is definitely a must and then you can just tuck these haptics that we actually do in a glue dial procedure that everybody is well versed with and that leads to fixation of the intraocular lens so this was just uh, what i wanted to showcase that a simple uh, uh, decenter 3p intraocular lens you can you can refixate it as a closed loop technique so having done this uh, i'll just forward this a bit and you can just have a look that this looks pretty good it's very well centered and uh, everything is all set and done for this case and then you just hydrate put the fibrin glue and you are uh, uh, set with that uh, with this case so 
I show you one more case. Uh, this is another case. This is uh, one case that was referred to me. This is a case of a uh, dislocated eye. The patient came to me and said that, ma'am, I bought an intraocular lens placed in my eye, but uh, it has got, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not there and uh, you need to fix it. You need to do something for me. So I probably when I just saw the patient in the, in the torchlight, I just saw that, I felt that uh, probably this is a case of opakia. I just asked the patient twice that uh, was actually an intraocular lens put into your eye and the patient said yes. The patient was a one-eyed patient, had lost the other eye in another complicated case. So uh, I again started scrutinizing this on the slit lamp and all and as you see in this arrow, you know, I started seeing uh, carefully. So I analyzed that, okay, yeah, I can see something bluish here. Probably that's a haptic, uh, which is there. So then I took the patient for the UVM and for the B scan and really found that intraocular lens was there inside with the haptic and with that. Now coming up to, uh, in these cases, you know, actually, uh, this isn't going ahead. Yeah. So uh, in this case, what I actually uh, felt, usually we refixate the same intraocular lens. But this was a case that had been operated, you know, um, uh, at a very young age for the patient. So I was actually not very sure. And I could not even see the uh, 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 the status of the intraocular lens in this eye. And this eye had a typical propensity of being so inflamed that you can already see uh, from this video, it looks like an inflamed eye. Uh, and in this case, I had decided, I again took the intraocular lens power and I had already decided I'm going to expand this intraocular lens, even if it's a three-piece IOL, because I could see that it's a three-piece intraocular lens. Uh, I think probably I took a correct uh, decision at this point with fluid infusion inside the eye. And I just try to grab this uh, uh, intraocular lens and I'm trying to pull this intraocular lens. Uh, once it is explanted, I just see that the haptics of uh, this intraocular lens are totally uh, D-shaped. It's no more the same thing. So I think probably uh, whenever we have uh, cases, long-standing cases of intraocular lenses uh, uh, being placed inside the eye, uh, and when we are not sure of the haptic configuration that we see in these cases, we should always explant these IOLs and go ahead with a fresh new intraocular lens with a newly uh, calculated intraocular lens power. So you see this, this is a totally denatured kind of thing. Uh, probably actually, I uh, somewhere down the line, I also felt that probably this got denatured, maybe because that it was hanging somewhere inside, it was probably rubbing on the globe from the inner side. And uh, this somehow happened to be this. But anyway, having explanted this intraocular lens, uh, uh, I just then go ahead again with the fluid oil procedure that you see in this case. And then I need not load the intraocular lens for this case because I already have a scleral tunnel out there. Uh, or else, even if you happen to load the intraocular lens after doing a good amount of vitrectomy, you know, uh, you can open up one of the suture and then you can go ahead because uh, these are one eye cases and we do not really want any complication in this. Now, this is a no assistant technique which I always do in my cases. You know, I just flex the trailing haptic a bit much more and then my leading haptic nice free, and then I go ahead with the externalization of this trailing haptic. Uh, this really beautifully works very well, especially if you have a press biopic assistant with you. So having externalized both the haptics, closing up of, this, uh, of, this, of the wound is very important uh, because you have had uh, vitreous, uh, uh, in, in this case, where, wherever there's a vitreous prolapse or there's a anterior posterior communication, always take sutures. Uh, maybe even if you have to take one or two sutures more, it doesn't matter in these cases. Uh, what you need to do is you, you need to have a closed globe in these cases. You have to touch the haptics properly, and that is what probably gives strength uh, to the intrascleral fixation in these cases. So, having said this, uh, I would say that this patient was uh, 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 the the patient had a, a brilliant post-operative outcome and is still doing good. So, uh, following this, I'll just try to uh, this video depicts refracting power uh, exchange. Let me mute this because. So now this is a case, uh, you know, uh, she's a young medical student who was referred to me for a surgery. She had her, this eye operated when she was quite young. And now what you see here is that, you know, uh, it's so much complicated. Uh, you have this uh, 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 slippage of uh, one piece intraocular PMMA lens into the anterior chamber. There's a posterior capsular opening. She had a, a, a refractive error. Uh, she had a great refractive error. I had to expand this intraocular lens. What you see superiorly, she also has a, um, this uh, a ring ring which is present. So I'm trying to create a scleral pocket in this case. 
Uh, I did not want to have any kind of phase stigmatism. So I tried to make this L-shaped incision. These L-shaped incisions are considered to be astigmatically neutral. And uh, these incisions, they are almost valvular, but still uh, being uh, 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 the uh, case of uh, vitreous communication, we need to take sutures even in this kind of uh, this. Now, this is the fluid infusion. I have used a trocar anterior chamber maintainer in this case. I specifically use trocar anterior chamber maintainers whenever, you know, we have a complicated case because I, at no point of time, I want slippage of fluid from the eye. Uh, you, uh, many a times, the anterior chamber maintainer tends to slip back, but this uh, trocar, it never slips back unless and until we pull this out. Now, this is a three millimeter by three millimeter incision, which I'm just extending. Actually, it's an internally, it's a six millimeter wound that works brilliantly, is volvular in nature. What I'm trying to do here is doing a bit of amount of uh, vitrectomy uh, because I want to cut down any vitreous if it is present at all in the anterior chamber. I have already cut down the vitreous from the sclerotomy site, which was behind this intraocular leg. So after having removed all the tractions, I'm trying to expand this uh, intraocular lens from this L-shaped incision. And uh, luckily, the entire thing, it comes off beautifully. Uh, now, having created the scleral wounds, I need to uh, dissect the plane between the iris tissue and the, uh, and the posterior capsule, but it does not give way because there is total adhesion out at that point. And, and then I'm trying to cut down everything with my vitrectomy probe. You can see this video also looks a bit hazy because, you know, it was a bit uh, compromised uh, uh, eye in this case. So uh, I just sutured this and I'm just trying to cut down all the additions from this sclerotomy site. And I'm trying to, I have supported the sombering ring with a spatula because I don't want the sombering ring to slip back into the posterior chamber. So uh, after having cut all the additions which were behind the sombering ring, once I press the incision, the entire sombering ring tends to slip outside the eye. So this is uh, come uh, totally out. I have a pupillary defect also in this case. So uh, I need to even repair that. Many a times vitrectomy probe, you know, it does not cut down the fibrotic tissue. So you might also uh, need a uh, micro scissors or for uh, scissors to cut down the intraocular radiations at this point. So uh, through this technique, again, through the same incision, I'm trying to do a glue dial. I'm going to fixate this entire glue dial procedure, uh, the glue dial lens, cutting down all the radiations which are there at every point of time. You know, uh, and uh, then fixing up this, uh, uh, doing this interest level fixation method. So, uh, having fixed this uh, entire thing, the next thing that comes is the pupilloplasty procedure. A lot of uh, procedures have been done now, and you know, we just came up with the single pass for the pupilloplasty procedure, and uh, uh, pupilloplasty procedure is now being done. You need to reconstruct pupil, young patient. She's a young girl. She's a young medical student. Now I think she has completed her MBBS also. Uh, at that point of time, we were not doing a single pass. So I was doing a, a modified seep search. You can see I did a second row also to finish off the pupiloplasty procedure. Now this is uh, uh, sealed up everything. And this girl, she's doing brilliantly. And the best part is she wants to be an ophthalmologist. Uh, uh, she wants to choose ophthalmology as her postgraduate uh, course. Uh, she's very much overwhelmed by what ophthalmology could do for her, you know. So this girl, she's uh, brilliantly doing with a 6-9 vision uh, currently. Uh, this is a simple case that I just want to show with Dr. Ritika. She was mentioning uh, uh, how to do the posterior assisted levitation whenever you have a rupture and you have this uh, uh, lenticular matter which is uh, going on behind. So uh, now there are two methods of doing a levitation. You can do a levitation from a trocar. Uh, you can put a rod inside and you can levitate the fragments into the anterior chamber. Alternatively, if you do not know how to use a trocar, you can also make a sclerotomy wound with a MBR blade at about 3 to 3.5 millimeters from the lipus and then you can just levitate the material uh, ahead. Uh, we have also described uh, the modified uh, the posterior assisted levitation wherein we use the sclerotomy site of the blue dial flap to levitate all the nuclear fragment uh, into the anterior chamber. So having done that, you know, uh, you can do an IELTS report in this procedure or you or alternatively if you find it quite difficult to know uh, what you can do is you can just extend the incision and remove the entire lenticular matter take up the sutures and then do a secondary oil fixation for this case in this case uh, what is being done here you know IELTS report uh, we try to place the lens into the anterior chamber but many a times if you cannot see that you can also do a uh, glued IELTS scaffold. I would not recommend any novice surgeon to do this because it's a very technical thing and it's uh, it's really difficult. It's not that easy because here in this case, when you do not see 
the tip of the leading haptic, you're actually working with your tactile sensations, uh, the sensations of your left hand and your right hand grasping the tip of the haptic. And that comes only with experience because you know what you're holding is uh, proper or not. So I would not recommend any novice surgeon to do this, but I'm just trying to showcase that this thing can be done. Once you have externalized the haptics, you can just tuck it and then the glue dial procedure in itself works like an IOSK fold and it is actually been labeled as the glue dial fold by Dr. Amarakalva. So this is one of the methods that can also be uh, uh, done for uh, remnants of the nuclear fragments and you can probably have a good outcome, but uh, you need to be an expert with the glue dial procedure. Sorry to interrupt, uh, doctor, but uh, I request you to wrap up in the next 30 yes, seconds. We are done. We are done. And uh, the, uh, these are just a book which I just published for uh, for reading if anybody is actually interested in this. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, I uh, end my presentation with this. I have to unmute. Very interesting set of videos. Very nice. Absolutely amazing. Nice. amazing, amazing collection. Especially that young uh, medical student that you showed. I mean, you did so many procedure, and every time I was seeing that, how you get that, you know that. Actually, uh, yes, actually, it's very gratifying. You know, when uh, especially the girl is a medical student, so it's really gratifying, and uh, I really wonder that she comes one day in between all of us, and she's an ophthalmologist. So okay. uh, yes. Something, some things they really touch you in your lifetime. So it is one of those cases. Yeah, I think that will be a very fitting tribute to the surgical expertise that you've given her. The yeah. best tribute a patient can give a doctor. But what do you think of the Yamane technique? I mean, are you doing it's that? A brilliant, it's a brilliant technique. Yamane is a brilliant technique. Uh, I have also done some of the modifications which I showed in your course, yeah, yeah, the yeah, handshake yeah. rebating technique for Indian setup, where you can use a normal... Uh, uh, you, if you do not have a 30 gauge needle, you can use a 26 gauge needle. You can use, if you do not have UDF haptics, you can use a routine uh, the sensor or any other uh, PMMA haptic 3 piece intraocular lens, and you can do the procedure. You know, you can uh, make a flange and then just rivet it. So you know that rivet does not allow the uh, flange to slip from uh, uh, inside the, uh, uh, the the track which is created by the 26 gauge needle, which is comparatively uh, much more than uh, thicker than the track of the 30 gauge. Needle. So that works brilliant. Yeah, because the sensor lens, the, the haptic doesn't go through 30 gauge. Yes, it does so not. You have to use. Yes, it's, it's difficult. You need at they least a 27. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. I agree to that. But it's a beautiful technique, Yamane. Many but more of the blue dials, you after you see them after five to ten years, you can actually see the bluish haptic. It looks as if it's almost subconjunctival, but there's a sterile thinning. Yes. But uh, we've never resorted to doing scleral patches for most of these cases. But um, it, it's it's real. So uh, your thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, yes, I have. I even I have seen some of my cases also. You know, they come up with those uh, bluish tinge. But unless and until um, uh, that means that they are probably comparatively a little superficial mm -hmm. than they actually should have been. Unless and until they are exposed, there is nothing to worry about it because they are always covered by a layer of the scleral uh, thin sclera. But still, they are covered by it. So uh, patches and all those are needed only when you have a frank exposure. But even when you have that, I would suggest that to go back inside and re-tuck it rather than putting a scleral patch or something of that. Because re-tucking can be done. No, no. Actually, I had a case. I think it was my third case, which actually was a myopic case. And I had put it. And actually, I had to do a scleral patch. Again, it was a myopic thin sclera. I took it around that area only on small patch. And it's still doing that. Myopic eyes are a bit tricky because they are big eyes. You do not have that okay. extra length, which is coming up uh, with the haptics. And we don't have any, uh, any IOL, which is more than 13 millimeters out here. So yes, that situation becomes a bit tricky for myopic eyes. Actually, I first attempt, I did a conjunctival hooding at that area. And then after around three months again, that started. So then I attempted a scleral patch and I'm still doing fine. I mean, many oh. times it does. Because those are the learning phases where we were doing very superficial, those scleral tunnel. But then now it's absolutely fine. Absolutely. Um, so, I think so. Thank you. Nice being with all of you. This went out. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. everybody.
become a point like we have to think when we'll see each other like this again. Yeah, yeah, Would it yeah. be another webinar or actual <laughs> webinar? No, like no, this very soon. <laughs> we all need to meet in person now. Yes. I don't know. Are we meeting in Chennai? I don't know in December. I'm just thinking. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, we don't know. I just cannot be sure. Our population has no intelligence. They'll start going without <laughs> masks and all kinds of things. I don't know. Absolutely. Even intelligent populations are doing are not doing well. <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> okay. I think oh, we should thank you so much. Nice, nice seeing you, Ritika. Nice, Priya. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, Raja. Dr. Vinod Arora is here, so we need to go now. Hello, Dr. Good afternoon, sir. Bye. No, I was enjoying your talk. <laughs> I, I have a one question also. Oh, really? <laughs> permitted, yeah. Because I'm not in session, but if permitted. Uh, what's your experience with Frank's 60 proline being used as such? For? For fixing the uh, loops, they are using just 60 proline. As I think and Sergio, the, Sergio's uh, technique is yes, that. Yes, yes, using yes. As, so I haven't used it as of now. For I have used only for, I mean, uh, for the aerodialysis repair and all 60 I have used with the flanges, but I'm not used for any IOL till now. I was seeing the video, it was looking very good, but... No experience for that. Yes, even I have not used it. Okay. I have to try it out now. Thank you. Okay. The next year. Bye -bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, you so bye. much. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, doctors, for the informative session and sharing your expertise and experience with all of us. It was indeed a pleasure listening.